Detective Carnby. God, I'm... I'm glad to see you. I was afraid you had left. Me? You're the one who just disappeared. It's... hard to explain. I think I blacked out. I, it was like I went somewhere else. It's okay, miss. You're clearly upset. No, it's... I don't know what's happening. I, this is a very stressful situation for you, I understand. Ugh, no, you don't understand. Just take a deep breath. Why don't you sit down, smoke some of the Perique. If you want, I could even drive you back to New Orleans. I just want to have a talk with Dr. Gray first. I want to stay. I found a talisman just like the one in the painting. I think I might be able to figure out where Tarawea is, where Jeremy wanted to go. That's great. Just stay out of trouble, okay? Let me handle the investigation. I'm not crazy, Detective. Not yet. <laughs> Catch you later. If a talisman like this can open up doors between the French Quarter and Dorsetto, then maybe Jeremy is hiding in some strange other world, like Tarawea, the place he mentioned in the book. No matter where he is, it's clear that my search won't be limited to Dorsetto. Paul, you're right about the plates on the boiler and the clock. They have been sabotaged, and I think I know who did it. They have something to do with Jeremy's episodes and how he seems to disappear at night. Right now, it's important that you keep an eye out for any of the pieces. I want to find out if I can repair the plates. Let me know if you find any of them. Lottie. Tell Lottie to take a look at the well in the kitchen garden. Dr. Elmore Lee Gray is DeSetto's chief doctor. Accounting and all administrative work is handled by me, Paul Waits. Magdalena Thompson, or Mags, is responsible for the household. Jean-Baptiste and Charlotte Tabois are responsible for keeping the guests' medical regiments in check. Finally, Jack Chance is our gardener, who can occasionally be seen in the conservatory, but is for the most part busy outside. There are currently six guests at Dossetto. Malcolm McCarthy and Ruth Talant reside on the first floor. Jeremy Hartwood, Elisabetta Perosi, Grace Saunders, and of course, Cassandra Beauregard live on the second floor. I saw you notice in the boiler room. You should know Mr. Chance won't be coming back. I got no business being in there myself, but you can take a valve from the wine cellar if you want to try to stop the steam pouring out. Be careful. I need the key. Looks sturdy. Doubt I'll be opening this. Cassandra Beauregard, the beloved author. Very exciting, isn't it? What do you want to put down for reason for admission? What her agent told us. Cassandra suffers from writer's block and needs to finish her moving picture script before the end of June. Mr. Chardot suggests Cassandra's heavy use of barbiturates is holding her back and risks ruining her career. And how should we summarize her personal history? Let's keep it short. Cassandra Beauregard is a beloved crime author who managed to pull herself out of poverty and into stardom. Five years ago, she tried killing herself by jumping off a balcony. The incident left her a cripple and now relies heavily on her wheelchair. And for diagnostic impressions? Cassandra suffers chronic back pain following her suicide attempt. She self-administers morphine to keep herself ambulant, 
but has become addicted and the desired effect is now lost. The drug abuse clouds her mind and she is unable to focus on real life. To save herself from this insight, she instead makes up stories to fill out the gaps in her own thought process, resembling the Korsakoff syndrome. Oh, bravo, Doctor. How will you treat her? First of all, she needs to be weaned from her drug addiction, and hopefully it will resolve her compulsive lying. Then look into permanently numbing her pain in her back through surgery. Finally, deal with her suicidal thoughts. Fantastic. With such a short time before June, I really hope she gets better soon. We will do what we can. Grace Saunders, 11 years old. Reason for admission? The mother insists on strict supervision by a proper gentleman to avoid further perversion of Grace's adolescence. Personal history? Grace's family possesses modest wealth and status. Her childhood seems ordinary, spending most of her time with private teachers and family friends. Grace's father recently passed away, leaving her mother the sole caregiver. And diagnostic impressions? Grace has trouble dealing with her father's death. She is willingly suppressing her feelings on the matter and isn't properly acknowledging the trauma she suffered. Any planned treatment? Grace needs nothing out of the ordinary. She simply needs parental guidance. Eventually, we can work on her feelings toward her father. Thank you, Doctor. I'll finish the paperwork and get her installed. Malcolm McCarthy, 54 years of age. Reason for admission? McCarthy admitted himself to Dossetto, stating simply that he needs some damn rest. And personal history. McCarthy claims he used to work as a lawyer in Baton Rouge, but says he can't go into details because of some legal dispute. His background remains largely a mystery, except for the occasional clue that he drops in conversation. Huh. And diagnostic impressions? McCarthy is an anxious man and an alcoholic. He often tells half-truths due to some deep-seated inability to trust other people. And how will you treat that? McCarthy will take some time to open up. Spending time with Jack's dog or the child should be good for him. Their harmless nature will help build his sense of trust. Thank you, Doctor. Elisabetta Perosi, 33 years old? What should I put down as reason for admission? Well, Perosi broke into Dossetto and was found wandering the grand parlor. She was confused and suffered partial amnesia. She insisted she belonged here and offered to pay for her stay. Right. What do you make of her story? Perosi claims to have been a member of the Astarte artist colony some 20 years ago. A claim that seems contrafactual due to her young age. She looks to be and even thinks she is 33 years of age. That would make her a child at the time. It seems fair to say that Perosi's story is untrue. Deliberately so or not. Diagnostic impressions? Do you have anything? Perosi's story is peculiar, because she retracted her story about the artist colony. She no longer claims to be the same person as Elisabetta Perosi. However, my staff's research has confirmed there was a Perosi at that time who was in her early thirties. I suppose this case will take some time to investigate. How will you go about it? I wanted to contact the real Perosi, but it seems the whole colony disappeared one night. September 29th, 1915, during a hurricane. I will have to take it slow and figure out what this spell of impersonation could have been. Oh, I'm sure it will all clear up eventually. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Ruth Talon, 29 years of age. Reason for admission? Uh, Ruth's father wishes that his daughter be removed from New Orleans nightlife for the foreseeable future. He fears that her overly free spirit is tarnishing the family's reputation. Sounds simple enough. Personal history? Ruth comes from considerable wealth. Her family owns several hotels and restaurants. Unlike the rest of the family, her sense of adventure has taken her around the world, including France during the Great War as a photojournalist. 
The last decade, she has provoked many rumors of being a debauched flapper, bordering on nymphomania. And diagnostic impressions? Despite her father's frivolous reasons for her to be admitted, Ruth does seem to provide an interesting case. She is refreshingly open and doesn't shy away from talking about her life during the war or her continuous celebration after returning to the States. She is admittedly a sexual deviant and feels no remorse. And her treatment plan? Simply staying at Dorsetto should do wonders for Ruth. If not, at least for her family's reputation. Ruth doesn't need to change, but with therapy I might be able to share with her some sympathy towards her family. I doubt she will settle down and become as dull as the rest of them, but at least she might try to be more discreet in the future. Interesting. It's all a patient files except for Jeremy's. Zodiac signs? I did it! I crossed the thresholds to my intended destination without a focusing device. My talisman now knows these roads, and I have no need for the plates. I can find my way to Lafayette as easy as I find my own room. I visited the grave of my father and seen the oven waiting for me. Thank you for opening these doors. I now must summon my courage and go back to that hateful mound outside the oil rig. I hope you'll be feeling better when I return. Jeremy. Despite making a fool of herself in front of Dr. Gray and Detective Convy, Emily felt surprisingly invigorated. She felt absolutely sure that it was her manipulation of the talisman that had brought her back to Desetto. Jeremy mentioned two items in his commonplace book that somehow connected him to two more dreams, or whatever they should be called. If Jeremy had two more worlds open to him, then maybe he would hide there if he was scared. Or maybe he found a way to tear away her, the place Jeremy so desperately wanted to visit. Excited to follow up on her clues, Emily set out to find the old clock and the boiler. Jeremy's room. All back to normal. Emily's here. Dang, looks like some kind of rot. This must be the clock mentioned in the commonplace book. This looks like the thing that held the talisman in the French Quarter, but it's broken and missing some pieces. The old clock was an intricate machine with eccentric astronomic motifs, but nothing appeared particularly unusual to Emily. But then she discovered a large decorative plate that reminded her of Miss Jackson's ritual bench, where she had configured the talisman to open the door back to Desetto. 
The clock's plate had unfortunately been sabotaged, but if she could piece the plate back together, she figured she would be able to repeat the procedure and maybe open up to another world. to remember how to get them out again. They are locked up for good reason. I am sure she is still able to whisper the answer in the ears of the wrong people. But not for long. I will see her burned soon enough. That black goat will be sacrificed to put an end to it all. Then it will all be over. No more Derseto, and sadly, no Astarte. Those good pirates of Ponchartrain. May you still sail the lake until you find the shores of Hali. There's some aggressive looking rot on these paintings. The Astarte Artist Colony, I'm pretty sure they had a Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain when I was a child. The simple astrology cipher was a favorite among the artists who lived in the house 20 years ago. They easily turned into numbers when needed, but also acted as signatures for the members, as there were only 12 of them. Everything's... I need the key. Suddenly, Jeremy's bleak dreamscape devoured Emily, drowning her in dread and darkness, only to moments later spit her out again. What had happened, and why? Was that her doing, or did someone else make it so?
Mr. Waits. I saw a piece of the plate that Liza broke. I think she's been hiding them. She's not very good at it. She just chucked it into the little room with all the tools behind the boiler. I left it there. I didn't want to embarrass her by picking it up while she was looking. We went upstairs instead and played backgammon. I let her win, because she's so unhappy. The piece looked like the one on display in Cassandra's room. You know about that one already, right? Or is your eyesight really that fuzzy? I hope you don't feel bad about your glasses. You only look stupid when you squint. Maybe if you had more eyes, you would see these things. I wish you had all the eyes you needed. Your best and favorite guest, Grace. It's another one of those plates for the talisman. It's all so broken and missing some pieces. Good evening, Miss Hartwood. That is your name, isn't it? I would be terribly embarrassed if it wasn't. You're right. Emily Hartwood, Jeremy's niece. Nice to meet you. Ruth. Ruth Talon. you're smoking? <laughs> How terribly quaint. Maybe so, but I like it. Would you care to share some? That smell is making me feel very nostalgic. Is it all that you hope for? I enjoy your light mockery, Miss Hartwood. I can tell we would make great friends. How flattering. Too bad you're locked up in this place. <laughs> your insincerity is really refreshing. I wish you were mad as I am, then you could stay. Give it a few years and I might just be. Lunacy is one of my family's few privileges. Oh, good. I'll be looking forward to it. You don't know anything about what happened to Jeremy, do you? Everyone here is really strange, and it's hard to know what to make of anything you hear. Occasionally, it sounds quite exciting, though. Good versus evil and all that. I'm sorry, but... I don't think I have anything useful to share. It doesn't matter. Thank you for the much needed break. Bon voyage. Emily felt surprised by how much she enjoyed the company of Ruth. There was something familiar and friendly about her, like they were old friends that simply forgot about each other.
Lost Plantations of Louisiana, Terry Bricklow, 1917. Their settle was a small plantation on the eastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The land was considered difficult for industry and was sold for only $30 to Elia Pickford in 1818. Pickford employed hundreds of workers from nearby New Orleans to clear the woods and build a small plantation mansion facing the lake with a striking Greek Revival temple facade. Terceto kept a modest production of Paris tobacco and indigo that persisted up till the Civil War. During the antebellum era, Terceto was the source of many rumors concerning voodoo and witchcraft. People who traveled the lake reported seeing people dance at night in front of bonfires, bleating and wailing. On June 17, 1862, Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army recounts leading a raiding party from ships anchored in Lake Pontchartrain in order to seize control of Deseto and free the slaves working there. The captain was surprised to find the workers fighting back with unprecedented zeal. Norton's account describes these men and women as enraged with fanaticism. Pickford reportedly tried to placate the raiders, but was shot in the confusion. Captain Norton left the mansion burning and retreated to his ships with his men. Their settle was left in ruins for several decades. The ownership of the land was long disputed and returned to the Ledoux family in 1901. Several police reports were filed during the following years as the Ledoux tried to get rid of a camp of squatters on their land. The police made several visits to remove the trespassers, but the people kept returning. On November 1, 1907, Inspector Legras of the police charged a deadly attack in order to save several children kidnapped by the squatters. Many were killed, and even more were jailed. The following year, Ledoux rebuilt their settle, incorporating the surviving stone foundation and adding a magnificent wrought iron conservatory. The farmland had been reclaimed by the surrounding woods, so it was no longer profitable to use as a plantation. Instead, the house was turned into an artist's colony. The Astarte Artist Colony was a successful group of artists, including figures such as painter Heinrich Cassel and poet Nora Keith. The group was also known for their beloved Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain. On September 29, 1915, a tropical hurricane tore through Louisiana, causing Lake Pontchartrain to flood New Orleans. Due to the remote location of their settle, it took almost two weeks for outsiders to learn that the artist's colony was abandoned. The twelve residing artists had all vanished without a trace. The empty mansion of their settle still stands on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain, with much of its temple facade intact. The Ledoux family currently has no intention of repairing the house. Are you reading anything good? A Brightness from Afar by Lord Boleskin? It's actually not bad. You know where Detective Carnby is? Oh, you don't need him. You're doing fine. I should probably go. Until next time, Cherie. Wet shot. Hmm.
I don't understand what's happening. Saki nante mwe, menka mi saki nante mwe, men le anjeni man man yo de shena. What are you doing sneaking around? You almost scared me to death. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disturb your ritual. I wouldn't have guessed voodoo was in practice at a place like this. The doctor may be all about science, but I know these roots have power. Do you know what's going on here? I have a feeling Dorsetto is cursed. There are several players with stakes in this game. Dorsetto isn't cursed or blessed. It's a battleground. And it would all be a lot better if you could get your uncle out sooner than later. That's all I'm trying to do. I wish you the best of luck, Miss Harwood. I really mean that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to look after my gombo. The housekeeper buried something in the flower patch beneath one of Dr. Gray's windows. She was singing in some Creole language, performing a peculiar bourgeois voodoo ritual. Certainly not an unfamiliar sight in the French Quarter, but voodoo had never felt this bitter to Emily. What's that? <sighs> it worked. Ah, oh, what's this? There we go. I've seen this somewhere.
Did it break? The clock just stopped. something. That's just the hallway outside Jeremy's room, isn't it? Emily deserved a sense of triumph, but she was too on edge to appreciate her success. There was no reasonable explanation why the talisman let her open up this other world. Was this really happening, or was this somehow all in her mind? There was no time to question her own sanity. She had to find Jeremy. If he was here, she thought. Would she find Jeremy in the hateful mouth? I did it. I opened up another dream. May 1923, Monday. All okay, ready for delivery. Maintenance, oil pump must be serviced. Any tampering causes large spills unless properly forestalled. Tuesday, shipment delayed but delivered. Maintenance, service bridge close to broken. Wednesday, prospectors reluctantly agreed to show the burial mound to Mr. Hotwood, a painter, who read about our finds in the papers. He means to return tomorrow and try to find a way inside. Thursday. Mr. Hartwood's efforts delayed. The workers seemed nervous about his presence. Hartwood promised not to return to the compound. Instead, he has taken up an offer by L'Officier, the riverboat captain, who means to pilot him to the site tomorrow morning. Hopefully that's the end. Work can resume. Maintenance. Bridge from the oil tower to the bayou has collapsed. Sabotage suspected. This is the devil that guides us now. Huh. I need the key.
Here we go. What's this? Break this, I just need something to hit him with.
Damn it, there has to be a way to get to the other side. Look down. Hateful Mal Jeremy mentioned in his book. Jeremy, you dropped your... <gasps> Mrs. Marcus? Get off of me! What are you doing here? Trying to find my uncle. Jeremy is your uncle? Could you please? Thank you. And it's Miss Hartwood. You don't remember me? I remember you, Mr. Bois. I met your brother, Batiste, earlier. I suppose he hadn't found Jeremy either then. We spread out to find him. Can I have this? I'm trying to get to Tarawea. Fine, believe the rest. I just want Jeremy to come looking. We have 
to leave before it comes inside. What? Where? Come quick. Dorsetto. The dream of the grave under the chenier suddenly vanished, and Emily found herself back at Dorsetto. Instead of Jeremy, she found Lottie, who just like her brother Baptiste, reminded her of John, who died so bravely in the war. She pushed her painful memories out of her mind and returned to her investigation, she still needed to figure out what to do with the boiler. Reflections on the Power of the Verb in Certain Texts by Juan Luis Jorge To act is in itself divine. Even the slightest movement of our hand is evidence of our soul in motion. Yet our free will is so easily overwhelmed by the dullness of everyday life. Our actions become rote and rigid, in spite of luxury and comfort. True divinity is found in the choice of leaving the stage where we all perform. People who discover this freedom unexpectedly will be struck by the terror of this revelation and become paralyzed, or worse turn to suicide. However, if you are able to weather that storm, you will discover that there is a divine path beyond that fear. There is a chance to dismount your destiny and make something new. Something that hasn't been planned for or predestined. There is difficulty in explaining this type of acting as it transcends our everyday choices. This isn't some banal decision choosing one career over the other or even who I should marry. Leaving the stage, no matter how, isn't a matter of course correction. It's a rejection of the story that the creator is telling. Come on, Grace. I'm too tired for games. I'll even let you play with my jackknife. Oh, good evening. <laughs> you haven't seen a little girl by any chance, have you? I don't think so. Uh, you would have known if you did. The only kid crazy enough to be in this place. She's not in her room, then? <laughs> that would be a first. Always running around causing trouble. She's very hard to pin down, that one. You want a sip? I'm good, thank you. Well, I should be going then. <clears throat> Unless there's anything you need from me. I just want to find my uncle before anything happens to him. Oh, don't worry, miss. He'll show up. <laughs> he is much too lily-livered to kill himself. Why would he? <laughs> it's his greatest ambition, didn't you know? Take care now.
McCarthy moseyed off to continue his search for the little girl. Emily had meant to ask why he was looking for her, but decided against it, fearing that it would just prolong an already awkward scene. Wet shut. It worked. <sighs> I don't have everything I need. The Barlow lens. Instructions. To double the magnification of your telescope, simply fit this Barlow lens to your instrument. Then operate the fine tuners to adjust the distance between your lenses. This is easily done while looking through your eyepiece. Simply search for a position where your picture is clear and appears flat. When correctly tuned, your telescope should present a clear picture with magnificent magnification. The lone and the lost walk a land of fear. When there is nothing you recognize, or no one to trust, you prepare for the worst. Something is coming, and you best be ready. Take the gun in the parlor. Give them hell. What's this? Now this'll come in handy. Okay, that wasn't so bad.
guess this works too. There was a dead body in here. Did I just imagine that? The body of DeSetto's clerk, transformed into some eye-clad abomination before he suddenly disappeared. Surely it was all in her head. A horrible vision planted by the dark man. It's wet shut. It worked. I need the key.
Do you teach piano as well? Huh? You're a governess. Did you teach those clawing Casino kids how to play the piano? How do you know about that? Just because grown-ups don't notice children doesn't mean we don't notice you. Yes. I taught them some piano. Are you any good at it? Not good enough to play a broken one. It fell from the attic. Brought half the ceiling down. It was Jeremy's fault, wasn't it? Nobody knows what happened. But you're not wrong. of the syringe hadn't hurt as much as the humiliation of being played by that child. Emily just couldn't make any sense of her behavior. Grace seemed amused, but not mocking. Was this just her being playful? As her feelings subsided, a second thought appeared. She wouldn't have injected her with something, would she? As the world moved into the new decade, America was spiraling into a maelstrom of debt, drought, and death. It was called the Great Depression and ruined many families. It was a fitting name, for poverty also breeds madness through desperation. Jeremy was of course no such victim, for he already witnessed the darkness within. He knew the shadow that stood on his threshold very well. It wasn't new. It was something that had always been with him. There's more of that unsettling rot. On the commonplace of evil, there lies virtue and stark irreverence, careless thoughts of luminous indifference. But blame not the beast we once were, which science so often wished to refer. Not the wicked full of sin, it is you who stand and grin. All our good intentions aside, whereupon we build our pride. Sunless solitude, follow not this corrupting light. Prophets of confidence always crashes out of sight. Hear me, for we all bear this mark. Thus we must remain alone in the dark.
There's something missing. So this is Grace's room. Cute. Don't you worry, Grace. Go play your game, bleat and bellow with the others. I won't be jealous. There will be more masquerades. However, I would love it if you would finish my mask for the feast. With love, Ruth. seen this somewhere. This must be the great Cassandra Beauregard's room. I'm not sure what I expected. Maybe something more extravagant? Miss Beauregard, I picked up your medicine at the post office today. As you understand, it needs to be administered by the orderlies for your safety. I have put the box in Lottie's room for now, and I'm sure she will find you as soon as possible. Mr. Waits. What's that? Let's write this down. What's that stain? Looks like some kind of rot.
Jasmine is showing another room. Something is open. Another one of Jeremy's dreams. Emily stepped out into the humid night and found herself recognizing the Lafayette Cemetery. She hadn't been here for years, she thought, and in a way, she still hadn't returned. This was something not quite the same. Hoping she would soon get to see her uncle, she set off to find the chapel mentioned in his book. while since I visited the family tomb. I hope it's in a better state than the real world. There we go. was the chapel where Jeremy had promised to mourn the mysterious Perosi. Maybe soon she would be able to talk to her uncle and have him end this madness. She just needed to find a way inside the chapel. This is the chapel in Jeremy's book. It looks like I need more medallions to open it. I'm not sure I have everything I need.
There we go. I made it out.
Emily, is that you? Jeremy. What are you doing here? Well, you sounded so miserable in your letter. I've come to take you away from here. I can't believe I made such a foolish mistake. All I wanted was for you to stay away. What do you mean? I bargained with the dark man. A pact to keep New Orleans safe with my own life as tribute. The dark man isn't real, Jeremy. There is nothing he can do to hurt you. How do you think any of this is happening? How do you still not trust my words? Fine. Then let me help. Don't be foolish. He will bury you next to me in his sunken temple for an eternity. I don't care. I'll find a way. I have my own talisman, and I know about Tarawaya. Oh, wait, 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 don't speak. Who's in here? Show yourself. You know who, Emily? He took your grandfather. No, I mean it. Who's in here? I can feel someone's in here. Tarawea, why do you want to go there, Jeremy? I've seen so many strange occurrences lately. Memories explode into existence and then burn out like tied glass bulb filaments. Dreamscapes crash down from the stars and sink into the sea. Doors that lead to nowhere and absolutely everywhere at once. With all this reverie, I want to think there's a chance that you found a way to remain alive in some way I cannot fathom. Just like I've learned to navigate with my talisman, maybe you, with all your knowledge, you somehow knew a way. A way to find me again, perhaps in Tarawaya. Oh, my love. Jeremy. I need to find out more about Jeremy's pact with the Dark Man. He meant to go to Tarawaya. Maybe there is something there that would help. Despite suffering the Hardwood curse herself, Emily never thought she would be seeing the Dark Man manifested in front of her eyes. To Emily, the curse was very much a psychological condition and not something that could suddenly step into a physical world. What did this mean? Could her own personal demons take form? Surely the only way to get any answers would be to find a way to the place Jeremy so desperately wanted to go. She needed to go to Tarawea. She was beautiful. I wonder what happened to her. Ferocious fate remained a mystery to Emily. Was she a part of Jeremy's story? Or did she maybe have her own? telescope lens. Well, why would he lock it in here? Jeremy had found a way to enter Tarawea, but he wasn't allowed to go. He knew deep down that it was impossible for him to cross that threshold. Instead, he hoped that Perosi would go in his place and burn his library to the ground so he could start again. But she never got the chance. Perosi had her own problems her own demons, and she died suddenly one day without warning. Holding the telescope lens in her hands, Emily suspected what it was, at least a part of the key to that paradise Jeremy so desperately wanted to see. Curious what she would find, she felt eager to put the lens to use.
Wait, what's going on? It's entering the numbers by itself? Okay, uh, great, so where is that? Was this dream of Terawea without a catch? A place for rest and comfort? Here we go. 